What's going on everybody? I'm Jason Schroeder with Vital MTB, and today we are checking out the Digit Datum. So Digit Bikes is a small brand founded out of Irvine, California, and the Datum is their inaugural full suspension mountain bike featuring their very unique analog suspension design. So the custom budded aluminum frame is manufactured right here in Southern California, and the frame features 140 millimeters of rear wheel travel paired with either 150 or 160 millimeter fork and rolls on a mixed wheeled setup. So the Datum is obviously a very unique machine. So without further ado, let's get into all the details. Tim, thank you for joining us today. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Of course. Um, before we get into everything about the datum, can you just give a background on why you started Digit Bikes? Uh, I've been making bikes and shocks for a long time. Way back when, in the 90s, I used to work at uh, tech support for Rock Shocks. So I've been in and out of rear suspensions pretty much since that all started. Fast forward into the mid 2000s, I've worked for a couple of bike companies. I've made bikes that have raced in the Tour de France. I've made bikes that have raced in Ironman triathlon, cross country, World Cups, all kinds of different bikes for various different bike companies. Um, so I know the inside of shocks pretty well, mm -hmm. and I know the industry relatively well, how to manufacture, and the frame design. Most bike companies, they'll have the bike engineers, and then the shock companies will have the shock engineers. And what I've noticed is there's not that much overlap between those two. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm either blessed or cursed to have both those parts in there. And I was always inspired by things like the Boulder bike from the 90s and the, the Maverick bike that integrated the suspension into the frame. One of the things I really like about integration, integrate multiple different technologies together to try and reduce the amount that's there. So although people are like, oh, look at that shock strut, that looks complex. Well, it is somewhat complex because it's different from what else is out there. But my real motive behind it is the integration provides simplicity. Mm -hmm. So this thing has only like two and a half pivots. It's three, but one of them shared with the bottom bracket. So I'm kind of calling it two and a half. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you look at um, many of the bikes out there, like there are six linkage bikes out there and they'll have sometimes 20 sets of axles and bearings and spindles. Mm -hmm. And every time you have a, a bearing, that's going to weigh an ounce. And then every time you get a link, you get a little opportunity for some movement in the bearing. Mm -hmm. You get an opportunity for the bearing to wear out. Every time there's a piece, there's a piece that can go wrong. And so with this, I've got so many fewer pieces, there's less opportunities for things to go wrong. There's less opportunities for flex. So really what I was trying to hit was reliability, rigidity, stability. Mm -hmm. Side benefit, there's no upper link. There's no clevis yoke that puts extra leverage on the shock. And in fact, any leverage that were to go on the shock is, is fought by the bushings that are inside of the strut, which is what mm -hmm. makes it a strut. So it's all reliability and it, remove so many pieces. So this frame ends up weighing 6.4 pounds, including the shock. Mm -hmm. uh, contemporaries in the same market are like two pounds extra for carbon fiber frames, mm -hmm. three, four pounds extra for uh, aluminum. Weight wasn't really my main motive behind all this stuff, but as a side effect. You know, yeah, not too bad. Nobody hates lightweight. <laughs> Obviously the analog suspension design with your integer strut is the biggest talking piece of this yeah. bike. I'd like to kind of get the the benefits of this design, but first, like, what is a strut? Because that's not a term I don't think people are used to hearing when we talk about mountain bike suspension. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what a strut is, is a shock with a structural component to mm -hmm. it. So basically a fork leg is almost like a strut, but inside of a fork you have bushings, you know, roughly here and here, and those bushings keep the big tubes concentric. And so the shock tubes that are inside, there's a 10 millimeter shock just like is inside of this and just, as, mm -hmm. just like you see on, the, on regular coil shocks and inside of air shocks. But this being concentric to this and being held together with those sliding bushings, unless you start bending these things, you're not gonna put any bending load into the shock shaft. Um, and so that's the same as what's in the top tube there. No normal amount of side loading is gonna do anything to damage or, or cause any loads on the bushings that are riding the shaft itself. Another benefit to all this is, as I said, a regular shock has eyelets, you know, seven inches apart. Mm -hmm. Regular shocks are designed to work on any frame and they'll typically make them between like eye to eye of like 165 to 220 or whatever. Yep. But you look at the 165 eye to eye, some of that is the eyelets. The actual mm -hmm. shock itself, where the oil and the oil and the air springs exist, that's only like six inches. So you're trying to get as much suspension travel as you get at the rear of a bike, sorry, at the front of a bike from the rear. Now this thing has a, you know, two foots worth of damper mm -hmm. and two foots worth of air spring to deliver six inches worth of travel. The rear, you're trying to get the same amount of travel out of this whole, both the 
air and the oil are stuck in a quarter of as much real estate. Mm -hmm. um, there's not enough oil in there really to cope with it. And there's barely enough air capacity to deal with the, the spring ramp and making it supple at the beginning, all of those things. Mm -hmm. This thing, the strut, is actually about a foot long. Starts all the way down here and works its way up to where this air valve is. Okay. Um, there's roughly six times more oil in there. That gives me uh, much better control over the way the damping works. Mm -hmm. But it also means that not all of the oil gets used on every hit. Um, even if you cycle the whole thing all the way through the, the travel, you're only using like a third or a half of what's in there. Yeah. Um, and so that means you can go three to six times longer between service lives on the oil. The sales mm -hmm. are still going to need some, uh, yeah. <laughs> some help, like with a lower leg service. Uh -huh. But that's actually really quite easy on this. You don't need to take apart the whole bike to get there. That was a question I had, as I'm sure anybody who looks at this frame starts to question serviceability mm -hmm. when you're stuffing a damper inside of a frame. But I know that that was something you thought about, like what's involved with taking the strut out and servicing it. Yeah. So as I say, uh, I worked at Rockshops back in the day mm -hmm. and you know, I've been taking these things apart forever and getting all the way into a shock is something that most people don't do. Dealing mm -hmm. with the oil side and, like, and the shims, that's, you typically send it away or bring it to your bike shop. Yep. Uh, but things that people do do at home frequently would be like lower leg services mm -hmm. or air can services on rear shocks. So for the, that, all that's required on this bike is you loosen the, the lock ring, okay. slide that down, clean anything off with a rag, mm -hmm. paint on some slick oleum, Put the thing back together, and that's analogous to what a seal change, uh, to what a uh, an air can or a lower leg seal is. Okay. on Things that people are most likely yeah. dealing with. To loosen that up, you just use a regular Shimano bottom bracket tool. That's real easy. If you do want to get inside of it, so the shock has a low speed compression lever inside of here. There's a rebound damper, so you get all the adjustments that you that I think are needed by mm -hmm. most people. If you wanted to get inside and you, you wanted to do a custom tune with changing the shims, porting out the piston, <laughs> who knows where people are going to go with that? Uh -huh. To do that. Um, you need to use a strap wrench to unscrew the knuckle from the shock shaft. Mm -hmm. You loosen up the, the lock ring, which is a Shimano bottom bracket tool. Mm -hmm. So these are all regular tools that yep. most people have. Then you have to take off the head tube badge, which is two two millimeter Allen screws. You've got to drop the fork. So it's more work than taking out a regular shock, mm -hmm. you know. But the advantages are it's a more reliable shock and hopefully you're not going to take it out. Yes. And then the whole thing slides out through a hole in the head tube here. Oh, neat. Okay. Do you offer the option for people to send in their shock or strut to be serviced by you guys? Uh, that's what I'm doing right now. Cool. Uh, and I have, well, that's theoretically what I'm doing. It hasn't happened yet, but mm -hmm. that's, that's what I'll be doing. And then I'm, I'm working on uh, video assets for showing how to do complete strip downs. To actually service the shock all the way down, you don't need any special nitrogen charge. You charge it up with a regular shock pump. 300 PSI goes in the IFP. Oh, sweet. You don't need a needle. You can just, it's just a shock pump. Mm -hmm. Having worked on shocks for the last 30 years, this is the easiest shock. And I designed it that way because I, I didn't have a factory full of specialist, specialist tools already made and mm -hmm. I wanted to make it easy to service myself. Cool. Why 140 millimeters of travel? Why not do more or less travel? It's the middle, it's an all-rounder. Um, mm -hmm. My goal is to grow this out to be a full bike company. Mm -hmm. I start out in the middle one because that's typically where my riding exists. Mm -hmm. Days when it's Big Bear, I can go ride that. You know, days when it's across the main divide and everyone's on their kind of gravelly bikes or whatever they are, mm -hmm. I, I can kind of get along. Mm -hmm. It just fits in the middle. Also from product development point of view, I figure if I start in the middle, it's less far to me to go to the downhill end or to the cross country end. I was looking at, you know, the most successful suspensions out there, the FSRs, the VPPs, mm -hmm. they've worked across an entire platform. And I figure if I can have that work on all the different platforms, I can learn more. Yep. You know, when, when it starts getting ridden by long travel enduro, maybe into downhill. I'm gonna learn different things from what I'm gonna learn from the, the, the cross country. Mm -hmm. And that cross pollination is gonna help me develop. This is a size large we have in front of us mm -hmm. we'll be riding. Do you wanna run over just head tube angle, chain stays, reach, kind of like basic okay. geometry? Yeah, so the head tube is 65, the C tube angle is 75, and the rear, st rear center is 435. Reach on this one is a 480. So it's all kind of middle of the road. Okay. There's nothing, I really wasn't trying to reinvent the way geometry worked. There's a lot of things that I'm reinventing here anyway. You know, <laughs> yeah. integrating the suspension, having a new shock. You know, yeah. I started the bike company and I started the shock company, which like turns out those are two quite heavy lifts. I've got enough things that can that are new. Yes. That frankly, things like geometry, things like ride feel, I don't want to reinvent that. It's taken us 30 years to get to this place where, you know, and mistakes have been made on both sides of the spectrum. We're we're kind of at the top of the bell curve. We're at yep. the top of the mountain in terms of where the forms can be. So yeah, I didn't want to, don't want to reinvent the geometry, don't want to reinvent the way the ride feel happens. If I can help with reliability, if I can help with stiffness, mm. um, and if I can help with a, you know, a clean look, the ability to have full length dropper post, mm. two to three water bottles, 
you know, I never ride with a backpack anymore. That's, that's where I was trying to improve life. Right. How many sizes are you offering and kind of what rider height does that accommodate? So I've got a, a small, medium, large, extra large. Uh, that I think is, can I say it's like five, seven to six, two? Okay. But I know I've got some people six, three, six, four have ridden them quite happily. Mm -hmm. um, are you gonna offer the option for people to like give you their body geometry and custom make it for them? It's or? something I've considered, um, not yet. Okay. Um, and not yet doesn't necessarily mean, oh, I'll get there in the next six months Mm. It might mean I'll get there in the next decade. <laughs> uh, I have the ability to do that because I'm in Southern California mm. uh, and I'm making them domestically and I'm just cutting tubes to make bikes. However, if somebody wanted a custom geometry, I would probably ask they bought 10 bikes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm going to need to send away a batch for heat treating and that's going to, you know. You got to make it make sense. So long sense. story short, no. <laughs> <laughs> if I got enough, if I got enough uh, demand for an extra, extra small, uh -huh. I could go make that. Extra, extra large would be an easier place to get to yep um but I'm, I'm waiting for that demand to happen cool is there anything else that you want to toss in that you feel like we didn't cover do you want to talk about things like the concentric bottom bracket i did have a question like about that i mean we've gone over most of the suspension but like yeah touch on the concentric bottom bracket yeah. what what is all that about reliability is really mm -hmm. as i say it's a big thing for me and and the fewer pieces that i have there mm -hmm. the fewer pieces there are that can break can go wrong mm -hmm. need to be designed the threads can rip out and so by combining that bottom bracket axle with the lower pivot, mm -hmm. there's fewer things that can go wrong. I don't have to worry about, oh, it's only this big, and you know, what if I pull the threads out? Mm -hmm. It's just never gonna, there's never anything that really can go wrong with it. Um, plus, that's where your power goes. It's a 30 millimeter axle on a, you know, on a next face, on a race face cinch system. Okay. 24 millimeters of steel on a Shimano. Yes, people do break bottom bracket axles. Uh, you know, people break everything. Mm -hmm. um, but it's one of the sturdier things on a bike. Totally. I can always know the rear end is aligned with the way the bike is going because mm -hmm. the way the bike is going is where your bottom bracket is yeah. perpendicular to. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, yeah. The kinematics also worked really well when the pivot down there was really, really, really close to the bottom bracket, but mm -hmm. I couldn't bring it that close because the bottom bracket was in the way. So the solution was overlap. Yeah. And so the, the fewer pivot positions I have, mm -hmm. the fewer of those there are that can cause play. But fundamentally to me, the, the simpler the whole thing is, mm -hmm. the better, Yeah. you know? Sweet. Well, thank you so much for all the information. Sure. That was super insightful. And I think uh, I just want to go ride it now. So let's, let's hit the trails. So after getting the full rundown of the datum from Tim, plan now is just to get out for the solid ride and kind of see what this bike is all about. Got some trails that are a good mixture of pretty punchy climbs, kind of your average trail bike climb, and then some pretty fun ripping descent. So should be a good opportunity to see what the datum is all about and where it excels. Oh yeah. one two hello hello all right so just wrapped up this afternoon spending uh, a bunch of time riding the datum and i guess i'll just give my my afternoon synopsis because obviously you know spending a few hours on a bike doesn't give you the most in-depth uh analysis of it but the whole idea here was to shake down the bike and get a taste for what it offers and i think the main word that comes to mind the whole time i was riding it is fun it's a super fun bike it's very responsive very easy to place where you would like on the trail it's light so that is a benefit you know climbing uh descending as well just an easy bike to make respond and ride uh how you wish and i think that's an awesome characteristic because we all ride in different ways so i think it's a bike that caters to a lot of different people I feel like i can't not talk about the suspension because that's obviously the most head turning part of the datum. And uh, 
I think in the best way possible, it feels like a lot of other mountain bikes. Um, that wasn't, I know that wasn't Tim's idea when he designed this bike, was to make something that feels way different than what everybody's used to. You know, it's, we're all chasing maybe say a similar trail experience and this bike performs very well and super similar to a lot of bikes of similar travel. You know, that kind of 140, 150 trail all mountain bike. I think that category is the broadest and performs the best across a lot of different types of riding. It also means that, you know, this isn't a light XC bike. Uh, you know, you might be able to build it up that way if that's what you're after, but the idea is for it to be super fun climbing, uh, not gonna beat you up. You can spend all day in the saddle. It also is a bike that if you get into really rowdy situations, the same as any other trail bike, it might remind you of that, but you know, it keeps you on your toes. And one of the biggest strengths I found just hopping on the bike right away is that even though it, you know, say it's a mid travel bike, the geometry and where my body weight fell on the bike gave me a really like confidence, uh, confidence inspiring body position. A body position that, you know, there's a few sections that we rode today that were pretty steep and steep and technical or fast and rough. And I never felt like I was getting in over my head, which that happens all the time for me, you know, getting on bikes for the first time. It takes a little bit to kind of adjust to how that bike may want to be ridden. And this was really comfortable right off the bat. Commenting on maybe how this bike compares to other name brands that people are used to. Um, I've been spending a ton of time on Santa Cruz's High Tower and then the new Fuel EX. And those bikes are comparable in um, travel mount that they have. And it feels really similar and it is super comparable. You know, it's, I'm sure everybody wanted me to jump on this bike and then just have a bunch of opinions or things to say about the analog suspension design and the strut and all that. But again, like in the best way possible, it, it really just rode like a lot of mountain bikes. Um, there wasn't any like one characteristic that stood out. It just performed very well, you know, in, in kind of every situation we rode today. I would say this is an awesome bike for somebody who, you know, has already been spending time on trail bikes. They know that that's the bike that complements their riding style and the terrain they have. And once a bike that's gonna be super lively, um, isn't going to hinder your abilities in any technical situations, um, you know, it's, it has a geometry and setup that is going to allow you to really push hard and ride fast. It might remind you every now and again that, you know, you're still riding a 140 bike with a 160 fork, but that's what keeps these bikes super fun. You know, you can, you can move them a lot better than a enduro bike, but they're going to hold up and perform a lot better than, you know, like an XC bike. Um, and it's, you know, it's awesome to support brands that are, have new technology. They're being made in the U S and you know, they're, you're supporting somebody who's, you know, chasing a passion, building their own bikes, and that's always rad, so. All right, well, there you have it, the Digit Datum. Thank you so much to Tim for coming out today and letting us ride his creation. That was a ton of fun. If you're interested in picking up a Datum for yourself or learning more, you can head to digitbikes.com. As always, thank you for watching, and you can head to vitalmtb.com for more mountain bike news. Thanks.